Hi, I'm Ethan Sommer. I'm a director of engineering at uh, Target for uh, external cloud and containers as a service. And I'm going to tell you today a little bit about Target's journey with Kubernetes. And uh, Jay is going to tell it the story about kind of how, how it's gone as we've deployed that into our stores. So I'm going to talk specifically about how Target is using Kubernetes in our data centers, in the public cloud, and in our stores across the country. I'm going to talk about how Target decided to bet on Kubernetes and kind of what our journey has been in our data centers in Google and uh, in Google Compute Engine and in our stores. And I'm going to tell you kind of what sorts of challenges we ran into on those different places and, when, uh, and what we learned as we went through that. Because I think it's a similar story to what most organizations would see, but you know, this is how, how we've experienced it. So how did, how did we get to using Kubernetes in the first place? About, I don't know, four or five years ago, Target started, under, started to kind of try to adopt DevOps and agile practices. And uh, part of that was trying to move away from kind of a traditional uh, dev and ops model and to try to empower uh, the development teams to do more of the, the ops work. And, and part of that was by adopting config as code. And, and, sh and to do that, would Target used a lot of Chef. And Chef was great, except for all of these problems that we had with it, right? I mean, people used community cookbooks that they didn't understand. And when they didn't work, they didn't know how to fix them. They took a long time to converge. They, uh, when we were using them in the public cloud, uh, if an auto-scaling group, like a node, failed and it got replaced, well, maybe one of those dependencies had changed in the meantime, and then it didn't work. And people spent a huge amount of time trying to make it work. It was, I think I heard some team, you know, maybe they were being hyperbolic, but they estimated that they spent 80% of their time doing deployments and 20% of their time actually you know, delivering software. So about a little over two years ago, we started adopting uh, Spinnaker and immutable deployments. And uh, we provided, basically the way that immutable deployments work is that you, bought, you provide, we provided the teams a base image, which had, uh, you know, met our security requirements and had some agents to do logging and stuff like that. And developers created an RPM file and they knew exactly what they were including. They weren't like including some community cookbook. They'd install an RPM from our from, you know, the, from our operating system. They'd install their software. They'd put a config file onto it, maybe a templated config file. Um, and uh, the dependencies are all resolved at build time. And builds took like five to 10 minutes. But then when you went to go spin up a, a new instance of your uh, program, it took only a couple minutes. But it was limited to public clouds. And it took the developer time, the time it took them to figure out how to like, get their stuff deployed, from being a, about a month to about a week. And one of the biggest problems that we had with, with it was that uh, you can't go out and buy an O'Reilly book about the way that we combined all of our tools together. We used a lot of HashiCorp tools, and we still do. This is how we do VM deployments. We, we use a lot of HashiCorp tools. We use Spinnaker. We use uh, an Elk stack. And so the way that we combined those together was unique to Target. Um, and so we had to write all of our own documentation and teach you know, hundreds or thousands of developers how, how to use this stack. Oh, and it was limited to public clouds until Target added OpenStack support to Spinnaker, uh, along with Veritas. We added support to Spinnaker, which is now anyone can use. So now you could use it in the public cloud and in the private cloud. So Kubernetes. Why? We, uh, why did we start using Kubernetes? Well, we only provided the Spinnaker experience to our non-commerce digital clouds using public, digital teams using public cloud. So only you know, a fairly small percentage of Target's developers were able to use Spinnaker in this immutable deployments. And so I, I actually got up, because I was leading that team at the time, and I, I gave a presentation to everyone and anyone who wanted to go in, in our technology organization, hundreds of people came, and I explained what we were doing. 
And they said, when can I use it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and so uh, we started working on making it so that we could, could do the deploy into our OpenStack environment using Spinnaker to give it to them. But the other thing that we did was we started standing up Kubernetes in our data center. And uh, that turned out to be possibly an even bigger uh, kind of change in how people got stuff out there than our OpenStack Spinnaker work. So in the, in the data centers, developers found the experience of using Kubernetes just irresistible. It was so much better than what they were doing with Chef, at least you know, based on how they'd been trained on how to use Chef. I'm not trying to knock Chef, but the, the people ju just found that they were able to, instead of spending 80% of their time, as some people said, working on deployments, it became something they spent a couple hours setting up and then they basically didn't think about it after that. They just checked their stuff into Git and it uh, wound up in Kubernetes and they could move on and start paying attention to making their application work. Um, and even as we were struggling, the team that manages Kubernetes at Target with some performance problems, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, they were still willing to put up with it because it made their job that much better. Application teams were much more likely to build resilient applications, too, because of the kind of constructs that Kubernetes has. Application teams knew, you know, were, were steered towards building things where, you know, we told them, hey, you know that each pod you put out there? Just assume that it might get killed at any time, right? Make sure all your stuff is stateless. And uh, as a result, you know, in comparison to our OpenStack environment, where I think the people generally thought of things as living there until they didn't, unless something went wrong. We told them, just, just assume it's gonna die. And as a result, they built better applications. And eventually, we worked out the performance problems, more or less, and uh, everyone lived ha happily ever after. But I've got a few more details. So here, here's an actual quote from, from a developer. He said that Kubernetes terrifies me, to be honest. Getting things running on Minikube took so little time and energy that I don't feel like I learned much about it. Am I crazy to have this fear that it works? I have no idea why, what happens when it doesn't work? And, and so that just kind of shows that like, you know, when people worked with Chef, it took them a long time, to, or before that, it took them a long time to get stuff working. And so they felt like they, you know, kind of understood how it worked. And with Kubernetes, they followed our directions, or they bought an O'Reilly book, and they followed those directions. And when they followed the directions, it just worked. So Kubernetes in our data centers. Um, so what, what challenges did we have? We, ha we had problems with ingress scaling. I mean, one of the things that, that we ran into was that um, as we were growing, like everything worked great before we had any applications using it. And then we would start running into problems when we had 20 applications using it. And then we'd go and fix those problems. And then we'd have problems when we had 50 applications or 200 applications. And you know, a lot of those things come from things like uh, there were performance problems. Some of them, you know, we've been doing Kubernetes for a while. Some of them have been fixed in newer versions of Kubernetes. Some of them are just kind of inherent to the idea that like, if you use the Nginx ingress controller, if you have thousands of pods that are dynamically changing, every time it does that, there's a 20,000 line config file that Nginx needs to reload, and Nginx doesn't handle that perfectly. And so, you know, we've been going through and kind of addressing these issues as they came up. Um, that's enough for that. So here are some stats about how about Target's use of Kubernetes in our data centers. We have, uh, as of when I pulled this a week or two ago, in our test clusters in the data centers, we have about 350 different application teams deploying into Kubernetes. We've got about 4,000 pods running, and it's not doing a whole lot of traffic, about 260 uh, requests per second. In the production clusters, uh, there aren't quite as many applications, so some of the application teams you know, haven't gotten to production yet. Um, about the same number of pods, and the reason for that is that you know, things are kind of a larger scale in prod, but maybe in test, teams have multiple different environments. They might have dev and stage or, and a perf test environment and whatever. And the number of requests per second is higher. Uh, not as high as in some of our other environments, though. So we run Kubernetes on GCP. I, in fact, my, uh, one of our, uh, someone on our account team told me the other day that the Target is actually the largest uh, user of 
Kubernetes on GCP who's not using uh, GKE. And I'll explain a little bit why we're not using GKE. But uh, given that we're here, it probably doesn't surprise you that we're running Kubernetes on, G on Google at all. So um, some stats about Kubernetes running on Google Compute. We've only got 44 applications there and 35 in prod. And we've got about 1,000 pods, but we handle a lot more volume there. And we use auto scaling pretty well within that. We've got about uh, much of target.com was running on Kubernetes last year through our peak season. And we had a peak of about 30,000 requests per second uh, going into that, uh, those Kubernetes clusters. Um, and we're more like 8,000 requests per second on a typical day now with kind of organic growth and whatever since then. Uh, so what sorts of problems did we run into in GCP? So there were some interesting things um, that we ran into. We still have the same sorts of ingress problems when we're talking from VMs into Kubernetes. When we're talking from our external load balancers, so like a customer with a web browser talking to us, um, then we can use the Kubernetes integration with the Google load balancers, and all of those problems go away. Um, and uh, But on the inside, we are using ingress controllers, and we ran into the same sorts of problems we had in the data center. Um, and similarly, you know, we can do a great job of failing over between regions on the outside, on the inside. Uh, some of the Google tools, at least when we started, were lacking to make that easy to do. So why not use GKE? So to be clear, I wrote this slide before this conference. Um, and so back in two, 2017, when we started, the role-based access control within GKE uh, didn't have the features that we needed it to have to meet target security requirements. Um, and we told our account team that, and they're like, oh, we really want to make this better. Um, but we went ahead because we'd already been doing it in the data center. Um, and that's kind of my second point, right? We, ha we have to have an on-prem solution. So we have to make a, a distribution of Kubernetes that works, that integrates well with target systems, that does all of these things. And we have to do it in the data center. And we use these immutable deployments where we make an RPM and then we bake an image and then we, put, we do that in the data center and we do that in Google. So it was pretty easy for us to do it in Google. And so we just went ahead and, and deployed the same stuff that we were doing in the data center into Google. And that worked pretty well for us, particularly given that Google, as I, that Google actually open sources all of their integrations that they have with Google Cloud components. And so a lot of the things when Google comes up and like at Google Next last year and they said, GKE can like integrate with this thing that Google, well, we got that too, even though we weren't using GKE. So I said I made this slide before this, the conference. Um, our Google, you know, our relationship with Google has been great. When we tell them, you know, they keep saying, hey, why don't you use GKE? And we say, well, but it's because of this and this and this. And one of those things, probably the biggest one at this point, is, well, we need to run something in our data center, so we have to do that. Well, you know, obviously with GKE on-prem, when I get back, I'm going to need to go reevaluate what, what to do, you know, in our kind of medium-term future, whether that's something that we want to adopt. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Jay to talk about our experience of putting Kubernetes in stores. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am Jay Chandrasekhar and I uh, work as a senior director of technology at uh, Target, uh, managing the compute services. Uh, what uh, I'm here to talk about is how we have implemented compute on the edges. Uh, Ethan talked about how uh, we use Kubernetes um, as a compute platform of choice, uh, both in our data centers and uh, in GCP. Uh, what I plan to talk here about is compute on the edges and how we use Kubernetes. Uh, just to lay a context, uh, I just wanted to understand the audience. Uh, how many of you kind of work for retailers? OK, good. So, uh, And I'm assuming physical retailers do involve. Uh, how many of you kind of? trying to solve edge compute problems. OK, great. Uh, probably some of you have solved it, too. Uh, but I just wanted to understand the context. So, so how I will go about doing this is, so I'll, just for the folks who are probably not from the retail background, just a quick 
level set in terms of why we need edge compute, right? Uh, so, so that's one part of it. And then I will give a quick background in terms of like the history of how we did edge compute in the stores. Um, and then kind of we'll get into the bit of the detail about uh, how did we actually uh, implemented Kubernetes uh, across our 1,800 plus stores, 1,829 to be exact. Uh, so why we need edge compute, right? So we, as Target, operate 1,800 physical stores. Uh, just like an e-commerce site need to run 24-7, we need our stores to be up and running all the time. Uh, the store systems need to be up and running all the time so that uh, guests can actually come in um, and buy stuff from the stores. Um, the, if you think about it, uh, either it is e-commerce or physical stores, um, a, a guest who actually comes in basically does the same thing. They browse items, they uh, put item, add items to the cart, they go in and they do checkout. Um, and what that means uh, for a physical store is we need to stock shelves. So we use a handheld device called my device to do uh, to enable our team members to actually stock shelves, right? So these are productivity tools. What I'm trying to get to is there's a bunch of productivity tools that our team members use. Um, and many of the retailers probably know this. Uh, stores are distributed. They are spread across geography, right? And uh, network outages happen. But you can't close the store if a network outage happens. So they need to uh, operate autonomous way when such things happen. Um, and what that means is we need to have the ability to work in a disconnected fashion, right? So availability is a big thing. Second part of it is um, response time, right? So we pride ourselves in our checkout experience. Uh, and if you take the other side of things where our team members work using productivity tools, we want really quick response time for them so that they are not frustrated with the systems they use. Uh, and if you take the checkout example, we use a metric called uh, scan to screen, which basically says, you know, if a cashier scans an item, it should actually show up on the cash register screen in 250 milliseconds, let's say. And that sounds great, but if you think about once you scan a barcode, what all things need to happen uh, before it actually shows up on the screen. It needs to fetch item information, it needs to calculate the price, it needs to incorporate the promotions, it needs to calculate tax before it actually shows up there. It all needs to happen within 250 milliseconds. So we probably have a different kind of issue to solve from a response standpoint, right? So those are two reasons why we probably need compute on the edge, because we just can't afford to take the round trip back to cloud or to our data center. So a bit of history. Um, how we operated compute in the stores. Uh, if you look at five years and back, uh, we bundle things, right? Uh, application developers build things, and they get bundled together tested most times by a separate team. There is a deployment team that actually did the deployment. There is a huge orchestration around it uh, because these deployments are huge and they cause a store outage, right? So, uh, and that's disruptive to the stores. So you need to find out what's a good time to deploy this, and that required a whole team of people to actually manage it. How many other retailers, this sounds familiar. <laughs> so, so, so we were there. Uh, so, and then around you know, 2015, 2016-ish time period, uh, of course, we started embracing uh, open source. Uh, we have the Linux server available uh, in the store. Um, and so people were able to start building microservices. Great, right? Uh, and then, of course, we use, you know, teams started using Chef cookbooks to start deploying. Right, it's great, and some of the challenges, like Ethan mentioned earlier, related to how people build cookbooks and how it becomes complicated. It it started becoming challenging for the teams. Uh, they were able to deploy it 
fairly successfully, but it's more like 80%, right? You still need to log into a sufficient set of stores to fix things. It soon became evident that teams were spending like sometimes up to 70% of their uh, de developer's time in actually uh, fixing things so that it will work in the stores. Uh, so, so deployment was like a nightmare. So, so we need, um, so we needed uh, two things from this, right? So uh, we needed immutable images, and we needed the ability to safely deploy them to the store. So, and what I mean by that is we don't want this mess about, like, when you, t when you talk about 1,800 stores, we need something that we are guaranteed it, it will work. Uh, and, and containers were a great concept. Right, and, and it let developers do that. It also brought in some other a benefit, which is very profound. We were suddenly able to build things once and be able to deploy in the cloud for our e-commerce, and then we were able to deploy it in the stores for our checkout lanes. Uh, so that was profound. So immutable images, and then we, were, we wanted to deploy with no downtime. One of the things that I really wanted the team to uh, be able to accomplish was we, we wanted developers to be able to safely deploy during daytime even. So what that, what that means is no downtime, right? So Kubernetes let us do all that. So great, then that's the reason why we want Kubernetes. So people agreed on that. Now, with that said, there are challenges. How are we going to implement Kubernetes across 1,800 stores and how are you going to manage it? If you take uh, stores itself, it's pretty small, right? So we don't have like a vast compute cloud infrastructure there. Um, we have basically in most of the stores three blades with a shared storage. So, so it's not huge. Uh, we have, of course, stores go offline. So it can lose power. It can lose network. So it needs to be able to operate by itself in an, some sort of like an autonomous fashion. Then there are other complications. Um, how are we going to, uh, if we do an implementation, uh, how are we going to manage deployment across 1,829 stores? How are we able to monitor it? Uh, how are we able to budget the resources appropriately? Those are all challenges. So the team went about solving it. And what they did was uh, they built uh, what we call as uh, a system called Unimetrics. So uh, Unimetrix acts as like this centralized system uh, for developers to interact with this fleet of Kubernetes clusters, which is 1,829 clusters. Um, and it will interact with this fleet of 1,829 Kubernetes clusters in an asynchronous way. And it implemented Kubernetes API spec. And what that meant for the developers were that they can interact with it as if they were interacting with a big, vast Kubernetes cluster. Um, and at the same time, um, I don't know how many people yesterday attended John Engelman's Spinnaker talk. Uh, we use Spinnaker for deployment. As, and Spinnaker natively supports Kubernetes, so we didn't have to do anything there. It just kind of seamlessly fit right in. Uh, Unimetrix does primarily two things. Um, it, it fetches the desired states that, that get supplied to it, and then it actually distributes it off to the fleet of Kubernetes clusters. Um, and then it, at regular intervals, fetches back the actual state. So that worked really well. Uh, we could let these Kubernetes clusters work kind of autonomous, but for developers, it kind of acted like a single Kubernetes cluster. We solved the problem of developers being able to build stuff and then just kind of deploy it. And it's not as simple, right? Like, we don't build things and just deploy it to 1,829 stores, right? So, so there are nuances around it. Uh, so we need to build more features, right? So generally what happens is developers will build an application or a feature. They want to deploy it to one store. Uh, in certain cases, if it's a proof of concept, they want to really 
send it to like a subset of stores. Our stores itself were kind of grouped into regions, and then we have different format of stores, small format, large format, um, and we also have specialized things in the stores, like you know, some have Starbucks, some have liquor that they sell. So we needed to, some way to group it so that uh, people can actually deploy them to this set of groups. Uh, so we, we leveraged Kubernetes namespaces to do that. And I don't know who came up, which developer came up with the concept of using animal names, but they actually use animal names to group stores. So Beetle is one store. Uh, it's exactly one store, probably a store in Minneapolis, Coon Rapid store. Uh, and if it is Valras, it has got 299 stores. So, um, and what in essence happens is we store, of course, these namespaces, desired states at HQ, right, on, at the central system. Um, the beauty about this is uh, stores can go and, of course, work autonomously. And if it goes down, uh, it can come back up and get the desired state, and it will eventually kind of get into the state it needs to be. The magical thing is, if you, if you build a new store, we just need to add it to the group. It will automatically start working. It will identify which applications it need to run. It will download them. It will run it. We don't need to do anything. It's almost like magic. Uh, so, so we solve that problem of building groups and providing developers that ability to run uh, applications in these groups, so to speak. So that's where we are, right? So this is a real snapshot of our production, Spinnaker, where an application, in this case called Promo Engine, being deployed to our stores. So they, they deployed it to the group called Tiger, which is a group of 600 stores. You can actually see that they're running version 7, and it is all green. Uh, Promotion engine is something that our cash registers use. So it's pretty critical for our stores. Now, so this is all working. So where are we now? So we started this journey early last year. And we onboarded our first customers around peak season last year. Now, we are in all 1,829 stores. There are three nodes in each store. So 5,466 nodes are running. We have close to 200,000 pods running in production across our chain. And it's growing, really, right? Uh, that's the state we are in. Uh, developers, so, so the goals we set out to accomplish being able to deploy immutable images, being able to safely deploy. Uh, teams can now deploy safely software to the stores during daytime when the store is actually working in a safe fashion, and they can do it across our chain. Uh, that's the story of Kubernetes in stores. Thank you. Come on.